really quick before the show starts, in case you haven't heard, we have a growing community of investors called the Scale Community, which is full of people learning to make massive income with their real estate businesses so they can reach financial freedom a little bit faster than building a rental portfolio solely over time. Because honestly, that takes decades and who has time for that? So if you're an investor who is serious about growing and creating a scalable business without needing to be a slave to it 24-7, then go to collectingkeys.com slash scale and apply. And if you're a good fit, we would love to have you join the community. So again, collectingkeys.com slash scale, go ahead and apply and we'll see if you're a good fit. You can have a team of five people probably doing as much as a team of 15 people if they're solid. What is going on, guys? Welcome to today's episode of the Collecting Keys Scale Show. So this is your first time to these Monday scale shows. On these, we interview operators in the real estate business, specifically off-market real estate, to hear about what is working for them in this current market through all the ups and downs and everything in between that we are experiencing in 2024, kind of the post-COVID boom period. And today, we are welcomed by Elvis Clark, who is a good buddy of mine down in Texas. And I originally connected with Elvis at a meetup with Aaron Muchstegi. And he is doing all kinds of awesome things on there in Texas. And you said you're kind of doing the full band from Austin to San Antonio. So uh, I'm excited to hear what exactly is working for you right now and how you are handling things in your market that is notoriously struggling for real estate investors at the moment. So Elvis, to get us started, why don't you give us a quick two, three minutes, who exactly you are, what exactly got you into real estate and what your team currently looks like? Hey, Mike, thanks for having me on. It's good seeing you. Man, uh, let's just get straight to it. So I've been doing uh, auctions. My primary focus and specialty is like auctions and foreclosures. Uh, I've been doing that for about five, six years. What got me started real estate was maybe 14, 15 years ago when I quit my uh, full-time job. I was a sales job and I needed to basically have like two years of income or something to be able to buy a house or car right before I quit because I was going to go co- uh, do contract work. So as soon as I hit those two years and sold, I was looking around for a property and I found one that was like in my hometown. So I'm from Richmond, Rosenberg, Texas area, south of Houston, born and raised there. I've been in Austin nine years now. So when I was looking for a property, I found this property that was listed on the market for, I think it was 110000 And I called them up. It was six acres, small little home. Called them up. The guy really needed to sell it. They weren't getting any offers at the time. And at first I asked, could they do a seller finance? So they said they were open to the seller finance. They asked me how much could I put down. At the time, I think it was like $1,000 down. So they actually even accepted the $1,000 down and I got it for 90000 Nice. So that was my first property, got my car, then quit. How long ago was that? Six years ago? 14 years ago. That was 14 years. How was that even on your radar at that point? Like the think about seller financing. Did you have a mentor or something? No, I just, I kind of like knew about it. And at the time, I think uh, I didn't qualify for a loan or something, something to do with the job. And I offered, I was like, well, is he willing to do a seller finance? Maybe the realtor brought it up, but I can't remember. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. But... I was just like, this is what I have, this is what I can do. And the guy needed to move quick and needed to get rid of the property. So he ended up accepting it. So that's great. I don't think I'll ever find a deal like that again, though. So <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. You were ahead of your time on that one for sure. Yes. That's such like an early adopter of creative financing like that from the relative sense. So you were able to get your car. Yeah. So I got my car, I got the property. And at the time, I didn't really know what seller finance was until now. And then I kind of like, you know, I go back and look at it and I was like, oh, okay, that's the way it worked. But so I got that and then I put my two weeks in and quit and started doing like a uh, experiential marketing for Vince and Brandon. I was traveling a lot to Austin. And in the meantime, I was like, well, I have this land. It's six acres. How can I develop this land? Started talking to people and realized, oh, you know what? It's going to cost me like a good chunk of money or to find someone to even do anything on this property. So I was like way behind on my time. Mm-hmm. And so a few years go by. I just didn't do anything with the property, just rented it out. And then I had a buddy back in Houston. Well, we had talked about getting the real estate again. We're like, man, it would be cool to try to flip houses. So we started going around, you know, just bidding on houses like in Houston. And at that time, it was so hard. We were going to so many properties because we didn't really have solid contractors and we didn't really know yeah. numbers. So these guys that have been doing it for years were coming in there and just outbidding us all the time. And then we met this guy one time that was like, oh man, you should go to the auction. 
and we saw him do it and saw him buy like six properties and we're like, oh man, this is really cool. And he'd been doing it for like 18 years. So we had a little bit of money saved up. We're like, well, let's just do it. Worst case, I can go back to work and, uh, you know, get some more money. So we went to the auction, you know, we bought a house, we bought a condo, uh, went through that process. But, you know, he didn't tell us we were going to need extra money. We used all our buying power. So <laughs> kind of had to go. <laughs> nice. We kind of had to go back to work. And then we didn't touch the properties for about six months. And then finally got there, uh, rehabbed one of them, sold it, profited on that one. And then the other one we just sold out as this because it needed a ton of work. And then we were like, cool, let's just go back and keep doing it. Nice. So how long ago was that when you started at the auctions? I think about five, six years ago. Okay, cool. So I was actually, I've been in Austin nine years, but I was uh, started real estate in Houston. And it was majority mm-hmm. buying there just because I couldn't really afford anything in the Austin at the time. Sure. That's crazy though, dude. Like I love the fact that you just went in and got after it, right? Because that's also one of the reasons I guarantee you that you're doing pretty well now is that you're not afraid to just take action, right? And like, just like, I don't know how to buy a house at auction, but I'm going to go and do it. I'm just going to go bid on these things. And that's great, right? That's a great entrepreneurial trait that I think is heavily taken for granted that most people just don't have that. So that's awesome though, dude. And so your your current business and exit strategy in, in 2024, what does that look like? And what's your specific role now? Uh, just kind of operator right now. Just kind of to... We slowed down a lot in the beginning of the year. You know, we had a bunch of flips and different innovations going on with the market shifted. And uh, we took some bit, pretty big hit one after another just because we were kind of like in the maybe in the five to 600 range on some of these properties. And some of them took almost a $100,000 dip. So mm-hmm. it just kind of hurt us. And then we just stopped going to auction. We stopped buying properties in general. Like, okay, we need to get rid of this inventory. I started like cutting some of our staff and just figuring out that. And then I was just like, well, let's just go back to, let's just go back to the basics, which I was like, let's just get one or two people, hired one or two people back, feet on the ground. Like I have two callers right now. I'm just looking at the deals, submitting the offers, and then we're just kind of disbone. I'm partnering up with other people to disown the properties, honestly. But I have a few buyers myself from the auctions. So I've like built up a quite a good friendship of cash buyers from the auctions. So they're still looking for deals, but team is pretty small right now, but she's trying to take it steady. Like, Honestly, I was just thinking about it earlier this year. You know, you can have a, a team of five people probably doing as much as a team of 15 people if they're solid. 100%. And that's what we've learned as well with our big kind of downscaling from our national company, just coming back to local, like we we're talking about before the show. Our top line with our local company is going to be 30% of what like our big national team was, but the profitability is so much higher. And it turns out we're going to be making actually more take home pay with less headache. And so why would we not do that? Right? Like it's just less HR issues, less churn of staff, less hiring and more actually being a real estate operator, which is, you know, honestly more fun than like dealing with whatever teams. Yeah. Cause I mean, I feel like the turnover rate in this business, I hear people talk, all, talking all the time. Like they're just like, Oh, go where's this person? You know what sucked? I actually had brought on someone that was really good on helping us on the team and they just ghosted or just went like offline out of nowhere. And like everything seemed like... Oh, they like quiet quit. Yeah, everything was going so well too. And I was just like, what the hell? Like I was just like, it's so annoying because he was doing such a good job and I'm just not sure if maybe something personally is going on. So I just, I'll give it another day, but like, what is going on? (laughs) (laughs) No, that's like, this is like this week that this happened. Yeah, literally they stopped communicating last Thursday and I was like, what's going on? Did you die? Did you, I mean, everything was going so good. And I just don't even want to go through that process of rehiring again for this position. So you're going to have to start treating him like a seller, bro. You're going to have to like get new phone numbers. You're going to have to call him, <laughs> have somebody else call him, you know, like do a little bait and switch text message if you can get him to engage with you. <laughs> yeah. That's funny, man. So how are you sourcing all your deals and everything right now? Right now, we're just focused on pre foreclosure and tax sales right now. Still looking at some auction stuff, but I just went back, like I said, I just wanted to stick to what I was good at and which is our focus was always auctions and foreclosures. So just really getting good at that because like with our model, we kind of offer a whole full service when helping homeowners with like going through foreclosure, you know, with relocating them, getting them on the credit program, all this other stuff. And I was just like, I don't want to chase too many avenues. Then it just starts to get too much. Yeah. How are you able to be like most competitive with like the tax sale and and pre-foreclosure stuff? Because I feel like that's like the niche that everyone, I would say that's been in real estate for a long time, tends to gravitate to 
And there's a lot of people. And as a result, a lot of new folks that we talk to, whether they're looking at like joining up with us in scale or they hit me up on Instagram or whatever, they're always thinking like pre foreclosure, tax delinquency stuff. And then when we tell them like, oh, we just like market to absentee owners with mail, they go, no, I don't want to do that. I want to talk to like the pre foreclosure people. <laughs> so I guess, how are you able to get deals like that that are actually good? Because the stories that I always hear is like people buy stuff at such insane prices. It doesn't make sense. Oh, I mean, sometimes, I mean, not the auctions, but sometimes like, Really, I think our advantage is is actually talking to the homeowner, knowing what to talk about. Because we don't mm-hmm. just we actually when we go in the conversation, we're not trying to just buy your property. We actually talk to you. Like, have you talked to your bank yet about getting a loan modification? What options have you talked? I've talked about a friend or family getting a personal loan to get your loan reinstated. And then after those conversations, then we start going to the other options. So in the beginning, we're building that relationship, you know, the rapport with the homeowner. Because we're not just like, hey, do you want to sell your house? Like, that's the last thing they want to hear when they're going through a foreclosure. So we kind of try to educate them. Okay, well, you know, what if I were to give you this $20,000 to reinstate your loan? I can give you a loan, but do you really want to have to pay me back monthly and then your loan that, you know, you just got behind on again? Do you really want to go through that? Or we can look at these other options, help you avoid the uh, foreclosure, bring your loan back to good stand and help you get some positive payments on your credit so it's not hit. And then we'll help you relocate you with one of our agents, get you into the rental for six months a year while we put you on a credit program. And then you can buy something more affordable. So we go through that whole process and then just really just depending on the situation, we look at all options. So yeah, that's awesome. So you're truly providing a service, right? Which I think is such a a thing that gets lost in the real estate investment business is it's not always just us and them with the buyers and sellers, right? You can provide a mutually beneficial benefit like that. Yeah. Like the legalities of doing all that stuff, are you actually like fronting money to get their loans reinstated? Like, how do you secure that? Yeah, yeah. So we actually use all our own capital. So we're all in house. So we'll basically reinstate the loan. Well, so we do everything. We'll reinstate the loan, and that's the difference. Like everyone wants to get into these, but if you're not aware, it's kind of difficult. Like you have some wholesalers that are very uneducated about these foreclosures. They'll go lock up the deal, and we've had this situation before where a wholesaler didn't want to release the deal. And I told him we'd partner up on it. And he was like, no, I got a buyer, I got a buyer. And I was like, if you don't have this settled or reinstated before this Friday of the auction, it's going to get sold. And he did get sold and basically screwed over the homeowner. She just lost her house at auction. And now, you know, her credit hit for seven years with the foreclosure. So yeah, right. But we go through all that process. Yeah, we'll reinstate the loan. We'll get them good standing. Obviously, we have an agreement and contract before we send any money. Yeah. Have you had ones go sideways? Where people like decide they're not going to pay you and they just continue to squat and then lose their house anyway? Or is that just not happening in Texas? You can just go drag them out and shoot them. Or we even submit a reinstatement. We already have like, uh, we're already on the deed of the house. Ah, gotcha. So you get it deeded to you first. Yeah, yeah. So then once you get the deed, you own the property. So they're essentially, are they trying to buy it back from you on like a lease to own sort of situation or like a seller finance? Or you're going to sell it and then they're going to walk away with some cash? Or is, is literally the incentive just their credit being saved? So it depends on the conversation. So there's different ways we can exit just whatever deal we work out and makes sense. Most of the time, we'll offer them some cash out of the equity. We'll look at the equity of the property. We agree to, you know, give them half up front after we take take the deed. And then the first thing first, we agree to the term, we sign the contract, we get the deed recorded. Then we, uh, first thing we need to mail the check to get the re- loan rates. We need to bring back the home and get standing. So once that's confirmed and we know it's a, uh, the foreclosure is, uh, not like in place, then we'll move forward with the terms of like getting her half her money and then helping her relocate. Most time it's helping them relocate into a new spot. And then we come in, we clean the house, we rehab it and then relist in the market or we already have a buyer lined up for the property. Yeah, I was laughing because you said her very specifically. So I'm guessing you work with a lot of like old ladies. Uh, but. <laughs> well, I actually had one in mind. But like, yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking about her because like we had one, like sometimes, you know, these are very complicated. Like it can seem like it's going good. And then they're just like all over the place. So what are some of like the biggest objections and stuff that you have doing this kind of conversation? Because it's a little bit different from what we do on the wholesale end where 95% of the time, it's like a cash flow sort of deal. The money matters a lot, but usually it's like security or things like that that people are mostly worried about. But with these, you're entering into a longer relationship with the individual. So are there like different kind of objections that you face versus 
like wholesale or like cash purchase stuff? Or is it kind of the same? Uh, I think it's kind of the same. It just depends on where the conversation, they already know that we're going to kind of basically sub to, we go through their conversation and sub to in their property, take it over their mortgage. Sometimes there has been where they're like, I just want my loan paid off. I just want it. And if there's enough equity and the deal's good enough, we'll go ahead and just uh, pay it off or hard money it sure. out, right? But a lot of times we don't want to do that. We'd rather come in with less capital. You know, if we don't, if we can reinstate and take over your mortgage payments, then we're only all capital in for what we're paying you on equity and then reinstatement, right? And then maybe whatever the house needs updates on. So we prefer that. But those conversations do come up where, you know, they're just like, oh, I just want my house paid off. In that case, we do try to tell them like, hey, if you let us reinstate the loan, get it back in good standing and then, and then get a couple positive payments for a couple months. It'll actually help you. But it just depends. Sometimes they just want to be done with it. We've had people where they're just like, oh, I'm done. I just, I'm just going to let it foreclose. And I'm like, dude, you have so much equity. <laughs> like, yeah, right. Don't be dumb. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you guys are enjoying this episode. We are seriously trying to grow this podcast so that the voice of what it really takes to grow a real estate business becomes kind of the norm versus the guru get rich quick BS that everyone is fed on a daily basis. With so many podcasts out there, it is hard for us to get discovered on our own. So a quick ask, please share this episode on your social media accounts, be that a real story, whatever. And if you would tag me at Mike underscore invest, then I will give you a follow and I will also send you a DM so that we can have a little chat about your business and any ways I could potentially help you grow. So again, please share it on your socials. Tag me at Mike underscore invests. That's with an S at the end. And I'll follow you and we can have a little DM, a combo about your business. And maybe I can help you grow a little bit or you could just say what's up too. That'd be awesome. But appreciate everyone. And thanks so much for helping us grow. So you are actually buying the property subject to the existing mortgage then when you do it. Do you, have you had any issues with the lenders doing due on sale or things like that because you paid up the loan and it's kind of makes them no. investigate? <laughs> you haven't? I would. No, not really. Not really? No, no, we have not. We've had homeowners where they're like, we're going to call the mortgage. We need to get this loan out of our name. And... You know, I do agree to sub, like, I know like sub two is the big thing right now, right? Like everyone's trying to do it. And, you know, I remember doing this like five years ago when this guy was teaching me. It's like the structure is so much better now, but still like all these deals too, where people get in, like you do risk, you do risk that. And then I think a lot of people don't tell you like whenever the homeowner can just decide a year later, oh, I just don't want this loan in my name. They can just easily call the loan and tell them what's going on. I just don't like fooling with it. I had a couple sub twos and then like one couple was getting a divorce and they just started like mm-hmm. a whole mess and the wife started reaching out to the mortgage. It's just, I don't know. I try not to keep them honestly no longer than a year. Sure. Yeah. So I, I'm asking that because we had a situation last December where we bailed out a landlord that was in pre-foreclosure on three properties. We bought them sub two and we paid up his loans. And literally a week later, we got called by the lender wanted to know what our relationship was with the previous owner and they called all the loans due. And so that process of paying up the loans, because it was like on the brink of foreclosure, that made them, you know, I think end of the year too, made them go and look at the deed and they saw that we were on title, immediately looked us up and saw that we were not who they did the loan for and they called it. So I wasn't sure if you'd face anything the same yet. But, and just so you know too, all the bullshit they say about, oh, just deed it back to the seller. Nah, it's not a thing. Like they made us pay off eight hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of mortgages in thirty days, which was wait. Really the, I mean, did you try deeding it back? Oh yeah, they're like, you can do whatever you want. They're like, we're suing him, we're suing you, like we're coming after you for this oh. for violating the loan agreement. And we we're like, okay. So we actually played hardball, and we were like, so here's what we're willing to do: is basically pay off the principal on the loans, not any of the back interest or anything like that that you're claiming that you now want. And if you don't do it, you'll have to foreclose on us. Um, and just so you know, we are very sophisticated and we will make it a pain in your ass. And they're like, fine, just pay us off. And that's what we did. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a whole freaking nightmare. So I guess I want to go down that a little bit more before we move on to another question. So like, what is your process for you securing that? Since you said it's like a little bit more clear now, like how do you make sure that if there is a divorce or there's an insurance claim or even getting a payoff statement that you're actually able to do that when you go to sell the house? Uh, so, I mean, everything's done beforehand. So, like, we have, sure. uh, we'll get the title check, we'll get everything done. I mean, we'll figure all this out before we even, you know, take over, agree with the terms. And it, we want to make sure, too, they're, you know, everything that they're telling us is correct as well. But definitely want to get title to look into it. Now, you know, title, there are title companies that do this whole process and stuff, too. So, they'll make sure everything's good. Yeah. So, 
we kind of just uh, go through the process with the title. We don't do any extra insurance because there is insurance with the mortgage from the seller. So we just kind of like take over that and pay that. You get insurance, right? With the mortgage, house burns down. How do you make it so you actually get the money? And the insurance company doesn't come and go, well, you're not the insured person. So it sucks to suck. Well, I guess that would be a conversation we'd have with the seller. <laughs> <laughs> Has it happened yet? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's always one of my biggest knocks on sub two is no one talks about that piece of it, right? Or like the biggest thing with ours when we were trying to do it, the fucking lenders wanted us to pay them off, but we couldn't get a payoff statement from the note servicing company. Because they were like, yeah. we don't know who you are. And we were like, well, we need this payoff. Like we're trying to pay off the loan. They were like, no, like you're not the approved person. And then the seller was like, well, I'm done with you guys. This is your problem. And uh, it was a freaking nightmare, man. Yeah, that, I always say try to be in good standing with the seller until you get rid of the property. You know, we have like one right now where the lady's just been a nightmare, but we just, yeah, we just kind of cater. We have that conversation. Okay, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to help you. Like she just made it such a, a difficult process. She was actually just playing the victim a lot, a lot of situation. And we did so much for this lady, but I was just like, you know what? We don't want her calls and issues. Let's just, we'll keep, you know, going until we sell this property. I would just say if you're going to do one, make sure you're in good communication with the, the seller and good terms just because. If anything comes up, you want to be able to work that solution with them. But honestly, I just, I'll look in these like Facebook groups sometimes, people where they're, they're like, oh my God, what do I do this sub two? Because everyone's just trying to do a sub two deal now. And it's like, man, it's, there's a lot more to it. <laughs> I know. And they're trying to like force them and they're doing weird stuff. I'm a big, I would say like sub two community pace more hater. Because I think you just, <laughs> you know, too many people try to do it incorrectly and don't respect how complex and serious of a thing it actually is. Yeah. No, it's the same thing with foreclosures. People just go out to them and try, you know, figure out the situation. Like, they'll go try to lock up the deal, but they don't even know, like, what's on the back end. And then when they go try to sell the deal, goes the title. Now it's like, oh, wait a minute. This property has this lien, has this much tax. The deal doesn't make sense anymore. It's just like, look through all those options before you start wasting everyone's time and even the sellers. Remind me, what is your, what'd you say your team looks like? How many people do you have? Right now we're five. So five. Yeah. So. I have three three callers, one feet on the ground in Houston, uh, one here in Austin, and then one in San Antonio. How do you keep all these people organized and get them trained up on this kind of stuff? Because this is like, what you're talking about is a more advanced version of real estate, right? It's not like yeah. a wholesale cash offer where you go and you run basic comps and you do 75% minus repairs. But you have a whole customer service piece to this. There's a lot of legalities around the pre-foreclosure sub two stuff, the tax linkencies. Are you able to like just find people that already know this in Texas? Or do you have like a pretty regimented system for getting people trained up? Um, It's kind of hard, man. With the foreclosures, I am still involved a lot. Sure. Right now, the people like one of the Houston guys, you know, he's been killing it. He wanted to get into real estate. And now every day, he's just sending me leads or he's like going and starting to door knock and chase these people down, showing up to the houses. You know, the best way I tell everyone will do weekly Zooms, training, stuff like that over it. But I just told him, I was like, look, if you're going to take this seriously, the best way to learn is just get someone interested and you're going to sit down and watch me do the whole process with them. What questions asked? What's the best solution? And just get them used to that. And then a lot of time, I'll just have them when they're communicating with the seller, I just have them, I'll text them or send them, hey, tell them to say that, do this contract. I'm having them do the actual experience themselves. Mm -hmm. So I kind of actually just walk them through the steps of doing the deal, but reviewing it. Sure. So, and it's such a small team. So it's not like hard right now. Like it just, I have to just manage it right with them and then just stay on top of them. But that's fine right now since we're a smaller team. I would actually, goal is to get one or two solid people that can at least eventually just take over this, know the options when they're looking at the deal, know what to do. And then they just send it to me for approval. And then I was like, okay, looks good. Right. But since it's more complex, like what are the questions? How are we going to exit this? What's the process like with the attorney and stuff like that? kind of still more involved. Yeah, that's always hard with sales reps in general anyway, because their incentive is different from yours slightly, right? Like they're incentivized for a deal to close period. You're incentivized for them to get the best deal possible. I mean, even to this day, we still hold our underwriting pretty close to our chest. And like the, the sales guys that we have, they can go and they can get ranges, but we're still the one that has to approve the contract price. It's just because otherwise what happens is they'll get like one big commission and now they only want big commissions, actually they'll be undercutting things or they have money problems at home. They're trying to get every deal forced through that they can because they need to get a paycheck. Yeah. And that's honestly, that's kind of been the 
like difficult right now. Like this new guy that's coming in. I was like, man, you're coming in probably like one of the worst times, but it's good. I was like, let's get the rep in because like we're submitting a lot of offers. Like I think right now we're doing like 70% just to be safe right now. Like we just got this born in a deal. The ARV was like maybe 155, 160. We offered like maybe 110. We'll cover close to golf commission and it maybe needed 10 to 15K, like 10K at work. So someone, they took the bid. Someone offered 130. I'm just like, I'm just like, it's just so tight. I don't know. Maybe they're holding on to it. But like some of these deals just does, don't make sense. And I'm like, I'd rather not be stuck in a bad deal because I've been there. And we'll just keep some in until we get one really good deal. Totally. Well, then what that person will probably do is they'll get to a week before closing. They'll probably shop in the 110 anyway and just create a shitty situation for everybody. Yeah. Because I mean, we're still, we still do off market deals. Like it, I have referrals and agents that send us stuff. So we'll just like submit offers um, usually. They're not our best deals, but sometimes they can be. But, you know, mm-hmm. if we can make a 10K fee or 15K, you know, that's still money right there. But that's to make sense for an investor as well. Because, you know, being a flipper myself, I'm just like, I'm not going to share a deal. If I don't think there's any like eight of them wrong. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, now, dude, that, that's the whole model now, dude. You go and you start a meetup and you just sell your shitty deals to all the sucker newbies that roll up. <laughs> Man, I get so many deals. I'm just like, I'm honestly, I just tell people, I was like, I'm not trying to go through all this work to make 10, 15, 20K after re Like, yeah, yeah, for so. sure. But no, that's a whole model that I've seen preached by people recently is like, if you become like the authority in your industry, you have more buyers because you can sell them to all the newbies that come through. But then ultimately what happens is all those newbies start losing their ass on the deals they buy from you. But uh, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's funny to you, it probably feels simple to an outside perspective, I would say you have a much more complicated real estate business than most people that I know. Just because you're getting more into the the weeds of these kind of transactions, you're having these kind of longer term relationships. So I guess with all that, what's been like the best system that you think that you've integrated, whether that's like a CRM, whether that's like an organizational tool, whether that's been like a, a mentor, like a coach, that's really kind of helped you grow this way. Because what you're describing is less common than just like finding YouTube videos or listening to podcasts to figure out what you're doing? I mean, I listen to all that stuff still every day. Uh, I was actually catching up on some of your episodes. Oh, nice. it is. It's like, let me just uh, check it out. I mean, I feel like you can never stop learning, especially in uh, this industry. We dealt with a lot of auctions and a lot of this was kind of new for us, you know, a couple years ago. Like we never really wholesaled or anything. So it was just such a different system because we weren't, you know, wholesaling is a whole, whole different ballgame, in my opinion. And been adjusted into that a little bit, but I would say definitely CRM systems work. We, when we first got started, we were using like Podio, this whole setup. And honestly, it was annoying. It was like trash. It it sucked. It sucked. And then we were a smaller team and I went ahead and just like created my whole like smaller uh, CRM system on Notion, which I built out the whole thing myself on there. And it worked line. It worked perfect for a pipeline. And then we're using, you know, smartphone dialers, stuff like that, communication and down. But Remember, we weren't doing like mass lists of like 5,000 leads. We Our leads are smaller because we're doing like bounties or foreclosures. So there's a little bit more to handle. But definitely a CRM. You need something with the leads, follow up, all that stuff. And then, you know, we, in the beginning, when we started trying to go a little bit more wholesale route, we were, I think we were doing, uh, you know, direct mail, which that is great. It's, it's a long-term game. And the thing is, we were just kind of like spinning all over the place. So that was like a learning uh, curve as well. Totally. So Yeah, that's a whole other skill set. So nice, man. So you're literally just, I mean, you're the epitome of an entrepreneur, dude. You're like, I can't quite find something that matches what I want to do. So I'm just going to build it myself with tools that are out there. Yeah, so I think we're going to be switching to RE Simply. It's just a better system. Uh, we're going to be switching to that. Mm-hmm. That's what we use. Yeah. Yeah. And then communication, we use like Slack and then, you know, WhatsApp. Awesome, man. No, that's good stuff. All right, so we're going to go into our end of show questions here to round out this conversation. So first question, which is always a crowd favorite, what is your craziest real estate investing story? This can be a big win, crazy tenant, wild transaction where you thought you're going to lose it 18 times, the time you found a copybara breeding you know, situation in a living room, whatever you got. Let's hear it. <laughs> Man, we've uh, seen quite a few things, especially with the auctions, just like hoarder houses. You've seen some of my videos. I mean, we'll walk through these houses in these really nice neighborhoods. Man, crazy story. I would just say one house, we gave this guy like two, three months to move out and he never did. 
we show up to the house, everything was still there. Like every item was there. He was like making his own beer and stuff in his master bathrooms and all kinds of crazy shit. And just had all kinds of like uh, ammo and I don't know, like fake grenades and stuff. <laughs> fake grenades? Yeah. So I don't know. That, I would just say that's probably the most interesting one. Just there was all kinds of random shit. And this guy was literally again, giving us so much trouble and just like coming to the property, threatened. And I was just like, man, I was like, oh, we just, you know, blow up this house or something. <laughs> and in Texas, you got to worry about that stuff too, man. People are passionate about their firearms and everything down there. Yeah. So I don't know. We've had quite a few. I mean, dealing with auctions and foreclosures, you're oh, like, it's it's kind of normal dealing with uh, situations like that. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Run of the mill. I like it. Cool. If you go back to the very beginning, what's one thing that you do differently? And you can't say like, I wish I would have kept everything, but like something that would have helped grow your business faster. Yeah. I honestly, if I would have gone back, I would have probably, I would probably would have stayed in my W2 a little bit longer. Interesting. And tried to leverage uh, more of those credit lines and loans because you know, being in, in sales and contracting business, I never was able to get loans. So that's why I was always just saving my cash and invested or trying to buy something. And that's kind of primarily why I got into auctions. And I think about it now, you see all these people promoting, like I explained in the process, like, you know, leverage before you quit your W-2, leverage uh, these credit lines, leverage, you know, loans, stuff like that. I would say that would have helped me out a lot and different opportunities. But, you know, I didn't go that route. I've just always been at sales and commission. And the way I see it, it's like, well, if I lose this cash, I can always go back and make it again. So, yeah, I can definitely agree with you coming from my always argument against people being a W2 at the same time is it is a hard business to build out part time, right? And there's always like a security blanket with a lot of people's W2 that prevents them from taking any real risk that unfortunately is necessary to make money in this business if you're serious about it. And I would say, like, you know, wholesaling too. Like wholesaling is a great way to get in. If, if I had no idea what wholesaling was, I just I probably got into real estate one of the hardest ways. And but I thought that was normal. You know, I just was like, oh, yeah. go buy, go buy a property at the auction cash. You know, and I definitely recommend. I always talk to people it's like, you know, get into wholesaling, learn you know the basics of that because you can get in with like little little amount of money and get started that way. And plus, learn the process. And then if you want to buy auctions and stuff like that, then you can you know go to someone to show you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, Elvis, last question. Where can people find you, follow you, and reach out to you? Uh, you can reach out to me on my Instagram at uh, the Elvis Clark. Shoot me a message if you have any questions about foreclosures, auctions, anything like that. Cool. And I guess just to reiterate, you operate, you said, from Austin all the way down to San Antonio area. Mm, just San Antonio, Austin. And we just started back in Houston as well, like near where my hometown is. Sweet. All right, it's that entire corridor of Texas there. Yeah. Right on, guys. Well, you heard it here. If you guys are doing any deals down there, hit up Elvis. He would love to uh, maybe buy some deals from you, sell some deals to you, and maybe even help you out in a couple of foreclosures if he's feeling friendly that day. So Elvis, dude, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. And congrats on your success. It's funny. I didn't realize all those details of your business. So it's always fun to and do like a deep dive conversation. (laughs) So everyone reach out to Elvis. Don't be shy. Remember, people come on these shows because they want to engage with you. Otherwise, they would just sit at home and not waste their time going on podcasts and things. So hit them up. Let them know that you're doing deals in the area and I'm sure he'll help you out. So thanks for everybody for listening. We'll talk to you guys next week. Awesome. Thanks, Mike.